I just laugh. I get so uncomfortable, I don't know what to do. I just laugh. Uh, thank you for that super great welcome. Um, hi. Hi, church. Hi, family. This is a different perspective. Uh, normally, I get to be up here and sing, so I get to hide behind Ben, so that's always great. Uh, being up here, though, and not having anyone to hide behind is really exciting. Um, <laughs> um, so as most of you know, I'm Bridget. Hi. Um, I'm full-time staff here at The Rock. I've been at The Rock for about two and a half years. Uh, it's been a truly amazing experience. I actually didn't attend The Rock before I started working at The Rock, which makes me a little unusual, but I was one of those house of prayer people. Um, and so I came here for the house of prayer and got connected and just fell in love with uh, this church, with this family, and with the people here. And um, <laughs> it's so weird being up here and knowing the last six months of my life and the journey that the Lord took me on. Uh, I didn't think it would end up here. I didn't think that I would be on a platform talking about being fat. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> just to be honest, he thought that, oh yeah, that's a good idea. Yeah, I want to do that. Um, but you know, the Lord calls us to walk our own paths uh, and our own journeys. Mine's just a little bit <clears throat> larger than somebody else's. <laughs> uh, before, yeah, sponsored by Starbucks. Um, first world problems, none of sweetener. No, I'm just kidding. Don't, don't drink sugar. Uh, before I go too far, I do want to pray for a minute, uh, but first I have to say hi, Mom. Uh, she's watching from Colorado, so hi, Mom. Love you. Okay, so let's pray. Uh, Lord, I just I thank you for tonight. Lord, I thank you for the opportunity to be able to share uh, what you've taken me through and the things that you have taught me. God, we just we ask that you make us more aware of your presence, God, not that we would invite you here because you're always here. You are always present. God, we just ask that you make us more aware of who you are. Make us more aware of you being in the room. God, I ask that even right now that you would begin to stir up inside of us the things that you have called us to tear down, bring down, and remove from being exalted above you, God. I just ask that you just impact our hearts, God, that you would open our hearts and open our minds to be able to hear you tonight, God. That it's not about me, it's not about my journey or my life, God, that it's all about you, that you are after us, that you are hungry for us, that you are relentless in your pursuit of us, and that there is nothing that can separate us from you, God. I ask that you show us your face tonight, God, that we would be able to see you, the man Christ Jesus, as a real man who really died and really stands before us, and who daily fights for us and fights for our hearts and fights for our lives. God, as much as we think that we care about our lives, it is nothing in comparison to who you are and how much you fight for us, how much you pursue us, and how you are unrelenting in your desire for us, God. God, I just ask that we would be able to hear you. God, that you would open our ears and quiet the noise, that we would be able to hear you, that still, soft, small voice. God, that we would truly know that it's you in our hearts and in our minds, that it would resound, that deep would call out to deep, and God, that we would hear your voice tonight. God, above everything else, that we would just know you. God, that we would believe that you are who you say you are, God. That we would believe that we are the people that you created us to be, broken or not, imperfect or not, failing or not, God. That we would truly get a revelation that you desire us, that you long for us, that you love us, oh God. God, I ask that you just make an impact, that you would make a turning point tonight, God that we would not be able to ignore the things in our life that are so obviously trying to exalt themselves above you. God, that we would not be numb, that we would not be blind, but God, that you would open our eyes to th see the things in the spirit that you see tonight, God. And God, whatever it looks like, whatever it feels like, God, we just wanna love you more. And whatever path you call us to walk on, even if it's crazy public, God, that you would just make it real to us, that we would just know you, God, because at the end of my life, at the end of our days, we want to be known as people who know you. That you would look at us when we see you face to face and you would not turn us away as people who did not know you, who did not pursue you, who did not chase after you, God. But we would be found the ones who pursued you and knew you. God, that we would know your voice, know your face, and know your love in a new and tangible way tonight. In your name I pray. Amen. I can just pray the whole time. We can just do we can just 45 minutes, just do all that. So uh, six months ago, uh, the Lord, getting from point A to point B, there's many points, but tonight's just A and B. Uh, so six months ago, the Lord had asked me to go on this journey. And 
Um, I remember probably about two years ago, the Lord started building a desire in me to do something public. Um, I foolishly thought it was going to be, you know, like I was going to write a book um, or something super awesome like that. I didn't know that it would be uh, telling my entire church my weight. Um, I had no idea that it would be that. But I knew that he had started to move me in a direction um, to tear down things in my life that were exalting themselves above him. And I thought it was going to look much different. You know, when I prayed, God, just let me love you more, I didn't really understand the implications of those words that I was saying out loud, right? I know y'all hear me. Um, I didn't really understand what that actually looked like and that when I say tear down anything that is not of you and then he does that, uh, it's a lot more painful than I, than I thought it was going to be. I thought God was going to intervene in my life, like magically intervene, like um, knock, knock, knock on my door and angels would come into my living room or that he would drop, you know, like a a perfect job or something in my life. I remember even when I was little, (laughs) as silly as this sounds now, I would like pray that the Lord would heal my fat body, that I would just wake up the next morning and I wouldn't have to do anything, but magically I would be a size two. (laughs) That would be so much fun, you know, thinking that I didn't have to do any work. I didn't have to do anything. I just, he would do it. I don't have to do it. He can do it, you know, and thinking that I wasn't actually participating in my relationship with God you know, which is not what he's interested in and definitely not what he's after. And so he asked me to do this crazy journey and he asked me to live my life publicly and to be honest and be vulnerable. And I decided that that meant that I was going to blog every day and I was gonna make videos and I was gonna do sermons and I was gonna do small groups and I was gonna put my weight online and I was gonna do videos every Monday and I gave myself another full-time job in the midst of already working over full-time here at the church. We're not overworked at all. We're fully happy. Um, (laughs) But I knew that I had created this thing in my life that um, I now call Mount 180. Um, I built a mountain in my life when the Lord just asked for a molehill. But I had decided that he asked me to be vulnerable, which meant that I was going to do this grand gesture. I actually thought that I would be Bridget the Great Conqueror. I thought that I would be the only person, because God obviously had ordained me and called me like Moses to part the Red Sea. Um, I had decided that everything in this was going to be simple and that overnight I was going to be able to change my whole life, go from someone who didn't really care about what she looked like or health-wise, what if I was lazy or what I was doing with my time, and move into being the exercise guru of the year. <laughs> who knew? Maybe I would have my own TV show by the time this was all over. You know, I thought that I was going to snap my fingers and suddenly everything in my life was going to be magically perfect. Because why would he ask me to do something so bold and so vulnerable if he wasn't going to do everything for me? Wrong. I'm so wrong. Um, so when the Lord did ask me to do this, I, of course, first of all, I told him no. Yeah, uh, obviously that didn't go well. Um, <laughs> but he wanted me to walk on this journey. He wanted me to walk on this path. He wanted me to know these things. Now, please be clear. Nothing surprises God. Nothing. There's nothing that you can go through or walk through or experience. Anything that you think is going to surprise God, it does not. He knew in the beginning that I was going to build this mountain that would be impossible to climb. And he let me. He's like, you're cute. (laughs) Sweet. (laughs) Go ahead. (laughs) You know, because I didn't ask him what it actually looked like. I just said, yeah, of course I'll do this. Watch me lead this charge, you know? And I had decided what it looked like rather than just being patient and actually asking him what it looked like, right? So I told him no, and he said yes, and then I said no, and then he said yes, and then I said no one more time, and then he was like, tell everybody on staff what you're about to do. And I was like, that's an awful response. (laughs) You know, I remember going to the doctor back in January, I had double ear infections. I went and saw my nephews, little nuggets, lots of germs. Um, I had gotten really sick, and I went to the doctor and I remember, like, I went and stood on the scale, and I, ha- I actually said out loud, like, whoa, as 260 pounds flashed across the screen. I suddenly had this moment of, how did I, how did I get here? <laughs> how did I let myself get so far gone? How did I let myself get to the point where I didn't care about myself? I didn't care about my life. I didn't care about my health. I didn't care if I was ready for any race or prepared for anything. How did I let myself get to the point where I actually was shocked by my own behavior? Do you ever have those moments? You know, where you're like, ooh, I can't believe I just did that. (laughs) 
you know? And that's where I was. I was at this point of like, I could no longer deny that the Lord was tearing down something in my life. I had to face myself. Even as this number flashed across this little digital screen and the doctor asked me what was wrong when I said, whoa, and I just looked at her and said, I just didn't know that I had gotten that fast. (laughs) It's like I had numbed everything in my life, all my joy, all my pain, all my thoughts. I had numbed everything to the point where I didn't even realize how unhealthy I had gotten and what I had actually allowed to take over in my life and what I had chosen to exalt above God until it was literally right in my face. So I was driving back to church and God told me to to tell my staff. (laughs) Um, That was really fun. I went to Nick and Diane first, Parnell, who run the house prayer. They are my mom and dad here in the house. And uh, (laughs) Diane gave me this look like, oh, oh, that's that's an interesting idea. And then I went to Ben and Ben looked at me like I'd lost my mind and Kenny and Brian and Toss and everyone kind of looked at me in disbelief as I told them I'm going to tell the entire church my weight and then lose um, 50 pounds in front of them. It sounds like an awful idea. It's one thing to do it online when anyone, strangers can access your information. It's a whole different ballgame when you're doing it with your actual community. And with people you see every day, and people who normally would never say anything about my weight, were suddenly asking me on a daily basis how my weight was going. (laughs) We'd have group lunches, and everyone else would order pizza, and everyone would be like, but not you. (laughs) Thanks. Don't worry, they got me salad. They were kind. Don't worry, they took care of me. But you know, it was a very different feeling to suddenly have all these people in my life all the time asking me about this stuff. You know, and it was so different to have, I called it extreme accountability. (laughs) I mean, just Francis alone would be considered extreme (laughs) accountability. (laughs) I'm just saying. (laughs) If you don't actually want to do something, don't tell Francis your ideas. (laughs) You're on it out there. (laughs) You know, but I had brought myself to this point where I chose obedience over comfort. You know, I had to because I couldn't deny it any longer. Like the Lord continually put it in my path, continually put it in my way over and over and over and over and over again. And he was like, I am unrelenting. Do you understand what that means? Do you understand what unrelenting means? It means I will never stop. I will never stop chasing you. I will never stop pursuing you. I will never stop trying to tear down everything that exalts itself above my name. No matter what it is, no matter if... Maybe it's your weight, maybe it's laziness, maybe it's pornography, maybe it's TV, maybe, it does not matter. Anything that takes a place above God will be torn down. Either we can be obedient and choose yes and say yes over our comfort, or we can say no and have him continue to knock down our doors. And eventually it either comes down willingly or it comes down forcefully. You can take your choice. But I'm telling you that willing is is a lot easier. (laughs) So I started to do this journey, right? I, I decided I was going to go start on the 1st of February. Nope, didn't. Second? No. Third? Nope, still no. Um, I actually didn't end up starting until the 10th. And I thought that this was really bad. 10 days? <laughs> I had really blown it. Uh, until I realized that it actually had taken me 18 years to start this journey. It had actually taken my whole life. Ever since I was in high school, the Lord was talking to me about getting healthy and losing weight and caring for myself. You know, because I never did. You know, I'm a smart girl. I'm witty. I always put my, I put my stock in that. I didn't put my stock in my body or caring about what my body felt like. And the truth is I got in a really bad car accident when I was 16 and I had a broken neck and a broken back for most of my life. And so I've always blamed that. Oh, well, I can't do that because I have this. And I, I can't do that because I have this. And I constantly built all of these excuses on why I couldn't do anything until the Lord got me to the point where I had no more excuses. You know, when he calls you to do something, he's going to remove anything that stands in the way of that. Even if it's, you know, my pain started decreasing. As I was like, oh, well, my pain, it's too bad. I'd wake up the next day and I'd feel fine. And I'm like, okay, guess I'm going on a walk today. (laughs) You know, like even though I wanted to deny it and I wanted to blame something, I just couldn't. I had to keep moving forward. The first couple of months were amazing. You know, my first month out, I lost 18 pounds and I was doing good and I was blogging and I was writing and I was doing my videos and sharing my life. And I felt like I had found the fountain of youth for fat people. (laughs) Like I thought that I had found this magic key oh yeah, well, just live your life very publicly. Everything's peaches and daisies that way. Don't you know? Just be obedient. It's so easy. 
I was pride, oh, so prideful. Um, but as I started walking, right, life got in the way. You know, my life got hectic. I got busy. I got, you know, my, I worked for RDS, the Rock Discipleship School, and my students were graduating, and so we had graduation, and we had retreats, and work got busy, and we had conferences, and everything just got a little hectic, and day by day by day, I stopped caring about what I was doing. And I didn't think that was possible because I was Bridget the Great Conqueror. I had done so well for three months. You know, how dare I step back? You know, but even with accountability and even with all of these things, I still started to feel something shift in my life that I was slowly depleting my care and concern. I was becoming apathetic. And the truth is I am anything but an apathetic person. I am very passionate. I love to build. I love the challenge. I like to go after it. So all of a sudden, when my personality started to change and I started to like not care about things, I started to crash a little bit on the inside you know, because I didn't know how to deal with it, and I didn't know how to handle it. I remember I was upstairs, it was a Saturday night, and I was typing, making slides, beep, boop, beep, bop. Um, that's my slide-making noise, I make it off every time. <laughs> You're welcome. Um, and so I was upstairs, and I just remember, like, I just stopped, and Toss looked over at me, and he's like, are you all right? And I was like, no. <laughs> no, I'm not. Like, I had hit this wall, it was like a, a light switch went off in me. And all of a sudden, I realized that I was in full-on burnout. For those of you who don't know, ministry burnout, it happens. It's very common. Um, but you just, you hit this wall, and it's like your whole personality changes. It's like I went from caring about everything, loving everybody, really excited about my life, to not caring about anything. I didn't care about my job. I didn't care about my, my heart. I didn't care about my health. I didn't care. I didn't care. I didn't care. And I didn't know how to deal with that. All of a sudden, all I did was cry. <laughs> uh, I mean, for days. I cried to Kenny as I had to admit that I was in burnout. I cried to Ben and Casey as all of a sudden I didn't know what it, like I didn't know how to not care about people. And so when I didn't care, all of a sudden I didn't know how to function. I didn't know how to walk forward. I didn't understand anything. You know, a lot of people go through depression and they feel a very similar thing. It's like you just want to care, but you don't. You just don't. And I didn't know what to do about it. And so I had to listen to my leadership because I have to listen to people that are smarter than me. Because when you're lost and you're broken and you don't know what's going on, the best thing that you can do is go to the people that love Jesus more than you and ask them what to do. <laughs> because they're the people that are gonna lead you back to the Lord. They're the ones that are gonna turn your face towards Jesus. Patty Deshaw was my coach through this whole thing. Every week she would be like, turn your eyes towards Jesus. And they, they all shut me down. They all shut me down. If you were following the blog at all, you follow it. In June, it went pew, <laughs> I had nothing. I didn't have anything to say. I didn't care about anything. I didn't know what to do. And so they shut me down. They shut me down at work. They shut me down in my personal life. They shut the blog down, everything. I was rebuilding the website. Me and Toss were doing the app. I left him high and dry. He's a good man, by the way. He really picked up a lot of slack for me in that season. Um, but, you know, I just, I didn't know how to function. I didn't know how to move forward. And so I was like, I would cry to the Lord all night and all day, just weeping all the time about why can't I care about anything until I realized that the only thing I cared about was him. Burnout meant that the only thing that I cared about was him. And to me, as hard as it was, you know, I had to understand that the only thing that he wants me to do is care about him. He wants me to do nothing sometimes. I didn't know how to do nothing. I didn't know what nothing meant. I didn't know what nothing can separate me from the love of God, even though I can't do anything. I didn't know what that meant, and he had to actually show me what that meant. And even though this was the hardest thing that I ever had to do, and the idea of walking this out publicly was awful and terrifying and painful, but I was met with such response from people that have been there and felt that and not known how to move forward. You know, he took me down to this place where literally I couldn't, I couldn't do anything. And he's like, you know what can separate me from you? Nothing. And there I was doing nothing, <laughs> you know? And so he brought me to Romans. Let's, let's, let's read Romans. It says, and I am convinced that nothing can ever separate us from the love of God. Neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither our fears for today nor our worries about tomorrow, not even the powers of hell can separate us from God's love. No power in the sky above or in the earth below. Indeed, nothing in all creation will ever be able to separate us from the love of God that is revealed in Christ Jesus our Lord. 
He had to show me what that really meant because I asked him to show me what it meant to love him wholly. And he said, nothing can separate me from you. Nothing. No thought that you think, no words that you say, no action that you do. There is literally nothing that can remove God out of your life. Nothing. He is always there and ever present. There is nothing that you can hide from him. There's no secret that you can keep from him. There's nothing, nothing. And we so often build up this idea in our head that we have somehow fooled God into thinking that we have it all together. I know I did. I was climbing Mount 180 very successfully. I didn't need him to do the thing he asked me to do. False. I needed to understand that nothing meant nothing and that nothing could keep me from him. Even in the midst of burnout, even in this thing that that surprised me, it, it shook me to my core. I lost my whole, like, personality. I lost my whole image of myself and all of these things. The only thing that remained was him. The only thing that rang true was him. And even though I felt like I'd lost my personality, the truth is I found myself in him because it wasn't about me. It was about him. And so I've been here for a little while. I've been in this, (laughs) burnout's really fun. (laughs) Um, Definitely over the last couple weeks, I've started to care again. I'm lucky a lot of burnout for a lot of ministry leaders ends up lasting months, years sometimes. You know, mine hasn't been that long, but God had to bring me to that point and he had to show me. And even though it surprised me, it didn't surprise him. And even though I didn't understand love, he chose to love me. He showed me that he doesn't love as in an action, that he is love. It's not an action that he can suddenly stop because you were a rebellious little child throwing temper tantrums, because that's what I was. It doesn't stop just because of that. He cannot deny himself. When he says that I am love, he has to remain faithful to himself because he also says, I am faithful. He doesn't deny himself and change his mind or change his, how he feels about you, no matter what you do. You could literally lay in your bed and cry for the rest of your life, and he would still be in love with you. I mean, do we get that? In a culture where we're constantly trying to attain some kind of level of perfection or attain some level of love or try to get people to feel something for us, we don't have to get God to feel anything for us. He's in love with you. He's in love with you. (laughs) Nothing you can say will remove him from your life. The more that I understood that he was after me and after my heart, the more I realized that this whole journey was about telling people that he's after them. The whole point of being vulnerable and sharing my life and doing all these really um, painful things was so that people knew that there's redemption, that he is who he says he is, that when he declares that he's a redeemer of your life and that you have nothing to be ashamed of, you truly have nothing to be ashamed of. I mean, I remember writing about making the conscious decision to make poor choices, putting on my shoes, getting in my car, driving to fast food, ordering it, paying for it, taking it home, eating it, all those, each one of those little steps were a conscious decision to make the wrong choice. That was not fun to write about. But the reality is, is that I understood that he was after me. And that someone else would read that and identify with it. I mean, how many of us have been like, I know this is a bad decision, but I'm going to do this anyway. You know, like we make the conscious decision to make poor choices. And that's what God's after. He's not even about your choice. He's about your yes. He's about who are you looking at? Are you looking at me or are you looking at yourself? So it really came down to just a couple of things that the Lord began to show me. He said, be vulnerable, be honest, be obedient, and be prayerful. I created Mount 180. He didn't. He said, be vulnerable, be honest, be obedient, and be prayerful. The truth is, being vulnerable was not very easy for me. (laughs) And although, contrary to what you may believe in this particular moment, I don't actually like talking about myself. (laughs) Again, it doesn't look like that, but especially since I've been talking about myself for six months. However, I always have kept my personal life and my private life very separate. You know, I'm, especially if you know me around this building, I'm a very boisterous 
stubborn uh, pain who loves to work. I love my job. I love to be challenged. And I love that professional side of me where I can just go for it. But on a personal level, I'm not really a big fan of like talking about my life. I've kept it very separate. You know, and the Lord totally blew that up. And I'm so grateful because the reality is the thing that I learned the most about this house is that this house and these people and these people around you are worthy of vulnerability. They are worthy of it. We are so hungry for community. In California, more than anywhere else I've ever lived, I'm convinced that everyone wants to pretend that nothing is wrong, that nothing, that we don't struggle with anything, that my finances are fine, my kids are fine, my house is fine, everything's fine. We're great. We're fine. But then we don't have any actual community. I mean, how many of you have felt like you're not connected? I can honestly say that I feel more connected to this house now than I have ever felt before. That my vulnerability allowed me to have community in a way that I didn't even know was possible. And even though in the beginning, it wasn't super comfortable having people ask me about my weight and ask me about my diet and how much, what is the exact poundage that you have lost this week? You know, even though that was uncomfortable for me, I knew that the community that came out of it would make it all worth it. Because it's true. I really do. Like, the Trings and the Haynes, like, both Kristen and Annie have stepped in as moms in my life. Patty has been walking with me every step of the way. Casey Woodward has been boxing me and talking to me. Boxing is like walkie-talkies. Sorry for all those who don't know. Um, It's like walkie-talkie. It's fancy. Um, And so I had gained community in a way that I didn't even know was possible. Because I chose to be open. I chose to talk about my life. I chose to talk about my choices. I chose to talk about emotional boyfriends that I had given my heart away to these men who offered nothing in return because I was so hungry for love, because I was so hungry to feel acceptance, to feel community, how I had given myself to all kinds of friends that I didn't value my time. I just gave away my time as freely as I could until I had nothing left and expected that I would have some amazing return in that. When the truth is, all I needed to do was just tell people what was actually going on in my life. And all of a sudden, when I started out alone, I was convinced that God had left me in this desert to die and that he had called me into this place to make a mockery of me. I mean, that's really how I felt because it was so painful and so abrupt for me to be so vulnerable. But now on the other side of this, six months later, I am literally flanked to the left and to the right with an army of people who walk beside me. An army of people that have been encouraging me and loving me and being kind. You know, we all want community, but we want God to bring it to us and drop it on our laps like some Christmas present ready to open. We want community, but we don't want to pursue it. We want to be pursued. The truth is, independence is a lie. We need other people, we need community. We need church. We need church. We need it. We need it. God didn't create this because he wanted to make sure that no one watched football on Sundays, okay? Like, we need church. I love football, by the way. Um, that's, not a, that's not a knock on football. Um, but we need church. Church is not about a bunch of people coming and sitting in a room, listening to a good speech, and singing a few songs. Okay, let's just be clear about that. This is not what church is about. Church isn't about so you can come here on Sundays and feel better about the rest of your week. You checked your box. You went to church. Well done. And I know that this may be uncomfortable, but church is about living life together in a real way, in a real way. It's about talking to each other, loving each other, being kind to each other. If you love without reservation, you will get love in return. I promise you, let my life be a testament to that. I found so much accountability, so much acceptance, so much love. I swear, when that first video ran, you could have heard a pin drop in this room. You could have. The second I said my way out loud, you could have heard people, oh, God, did she just do that? I I was standing behind the stage. I swear you could actually hear my heart beating in the room. I was like, can anyone else hear that? It was hard. It was not easy. It wasn't, but I have more friends with The Rock than I've ever had before. Real friends, real people who really care about me, really. They care about my life. They care about who I am. They care if I love Jesus. They care if my eyes are focused on him and not on myself. They care. So we're going to do a little experiment. I like interactive things. We're going to take a minute, and actually, I want you to talk to the people sitting next to you. 
Because we come into this room and we don't actually know the people that are sitting in front of us, behind us, around us. We call ourselves a church. Let's be a church. Have a conversation with the person sitting next to you. We're going to do three minutes. Okay? 180 seconds, 180 days. You get it? Uh, uh, uh. If I can do six months, y'all can do three minutes. So, all right. Ready? Are you ready? Set a timer for three minutes. Okay, three minutes and count. my timer. Three minutes, not so bad. Who made a new friend? Anybody? Yeah. Making new friends left and right. <laughs> yeah, push it. Three minutes, not so bad, right? That's probably the most some of us have talked to people at church in months, probably. <laughs> Sorry. Just being real. It's so easy to come in and out of these doors and just not even see people. These are people. These are people who are hurting. These are people who live life and who can walk beside you and be your friend. This is your house. This is your community. This is, this is what real life is. You don't have to walk alone. Don't believe the lie that you are alone. Just don't believe it. Don't agree with that lie. Independence is a lie. We are built to love each other. We are built to need each other. And if that makes you uncomfortable, just get all comfortable in it because that's just the way it is. <laughs> that's the way God created us. So be vulnerable. Let's look at Ecclesiastes really fast. I love this verse. Two people are better off than one for they can help each other succeed. If one person falls, the other can reach out and help. But someone who falls alone is in real trouble. 
Likewise, two people lying close together can keep each other warm, but how can one be warm alone? A person standing alone can be attacked and defeated, but two can stand back to back and conquer. Three are even better for a triple braided cord is not easily broken. My prayer is that this house would be a house that is not easily broken. Because if you think it's hard now, it's just going to get harder. (laughs) We have an opportunity to be vulnerable with each other, to be real with each other, and to love each other. I'm going to fly through the rest of this because it's already 8.10. But I do want to talk quickly about the other things that the Lord called me to do. He really called me to be honest. Um, And being vulnerable is one thing, but being honest in that vulnerability is way harder. (laughs) I don't want to set you up for, you know, having a misconception about what's going to happen in your life. Being vulnerable is really hard. It's really hard. Being honest is really hard. Chris Entering actually told me one of the best things. When I stood up and I showed my video, she called me and she said, when you speak your secrets out loud, when you're honest and you bring these things to light, you remove their power. Amen. Yeah, right? She's a smart lady. <laughs> you know, but it's, it's so true that we give, we give our secrets power when we're afraid that other people are going to know about them. You know, when the reality is that our nation is the most obese, in debt, addicted, and medicated adult population in all of U.S. history. Don't tell me that there ain't somebody else in this room who's dealing with the same thing that you're dealing with. Even the most, the thing that we exalt above all other sins, we look at pornography, right? It's 50% of people in the church admit that pornography is an issue. 50%. That's not just men. It's 50% of people. Admit that. Think about all the people that don't admit it. That's the thing. The, the worst thing about shame is that the less we talk about it, the more you have of it. Where if we actually stand and believe that God is a redeemer, that he is who he says that he is, that nothing is beyond his reach, nothing is beyond his mercy, nothing is beyond his grace, then we can stand and say our greatest weakness and know that God is going to meet us there. It's not a question. It's not, oh God, I'm nervous. Will you be there? He will be there period, because he's always there. And all these things we let heap shame and fear and pain upon us are not real. Don't trust in your fear, trust in him. And being honest, it's not even about trusting people, it's about trusting him. I was afraid that I was going to get judged, that people were going to look at me in disbelief. Okay, that one did happen. Everyone did look at me in disbelief, but they weren't, they didn't stare at me. They didn't stare at me in disbelief because I because they were judging me, they looked at me in disbelief because they were proud of me. Because they were, they were impressed by my bravery. And I, don't, I wouldn't say that it's bravery. I just got to the point where enough was enough. It wasn't about being brave. It was about whatever it takes. If it means that I have to get up here and get on a scale and make a YouTube video about that, then that's what that means. Because I can tell you on this side, even through burnout, even through everything that I experienced, I can tell you that on this side, It's worth it. It's worth it. It's worth it to be honest. It's worth it to be vulnerable. It's worth it. Because I'm happier now. There's there's happiness in surrender. There's freedom in surrender. All of these things that you think are going to destroy your life are the things that are destroying your life. If you just release them from you, suddenly your life looks a lot different. All these things that you think are controlling you aren't controlling you. We're just choosing to let them be our comfort instead of God be our comfort. And if we're honest about those things and real about those things, then he can remove them. If you're agreeing with lies, then at least admit that you're agreeing with lies. Tell somebody in your life. You know, because the truth is, for a long time, I'm a very confident girl. I am, obviously. (laughs) Um, You know, I always liked who I am. I just didn't like the package. And I wasn't willing to be open about that. And I wasn't willing to admit that. I didn't like that I had to admit weakness and that my fat body was a physical manifestation of my lack of obedience and my lack of discipline. And all of these things that suddenly came out of the woodworks as I started to talk about everything. I didn't want to do that. But there's freedom in that. I promise you that God will meet you when he calls you to be obedient. Period. He will meet you. You know, he also told me to be obedient. I remember my first dance recital, first time I publicly failed. Imagine little five-year-old little nugget Bridget 
I had my little tutu, my little black leotard. And I got up to learn my perfectly rehearsed steps and dance this out without flaw. I fell down. <laughs> I fell down from the very moment. I remember my mom, she was so proud of me that I just tried. Even though I wasn't obedient to the steps that I had learned and I hadn't done what I had set out to do and I had publicly, physically fallen. I'm very clumsy. I fall a lot. Do you see this leg? Oh, I'm crazy. I got bruises up and down my legs. I'm very clumsy and I've had to learn over time to just be comfortable with failure. Because no matter how hard I try, I'm going to fall down. I'm going to fall down. Be obedient. Do what he calls you to do, even if you're going to fall down. Because guess what? You probably will. Because he created us to need him in the process. We can't be the people that he created us to be without him, without being obedient to him, without violently and tenaciously tearing down the things that exalt themselves above the Lord. We're going to do one more experiment. This one's quick, too. This is going to be the most uncomfortable three minutes of your day. Again, 180 seconds. Do you like how it all ties in there? You like that? Okay. We're going to sit and we're going to, we're going to wait on the Lord. We're living in a culture that is so covered by noise and distractions and issues and cell phones and radios and TVs that rarely do we just stop talking and sit in silence for three minutes. Now, the first minute, I encourage you, don't look around. Keep your eyes closed. Give this three minutes. If no other time that you gave to the Lord today, give this three minutes to waiting on hearing his voice. The first minute, you're going to get uncomfortable. It's going to feel awkward. You're going to hear lists in your head. What, is, what do I have to do when I leave here? What do I have to do when I get home? What do I have to do tomorrow? Just forget about it. Forget about it. Three minutes. Give him three minutes and ask him this one question. What's the one thing in my life that's exalting itself above you and keeping me from loving you? What is the first thing that you want me to go after? You may think of 15 things. This isn't about 15 things. This is about one thing. I have plenty of other stuff in my life that God's still gonna deal with. It wasn't just my weight. It wasn't just my obedience or what I chose to put in my mouth. It was about, he wasn't after my success, after what I saw it as. You know, he didn't see that. He was after me. And to be honest, I'm not here so that everyone can make me feel better about this journey that I went on, even though I feel like I failed because I didn't hit my mark. I didn't do my blogs. I didn't do this thing that I, I didn't finish climbing this mountain that I had created. I'm not here to feel better about that. I'm here because God is after us. He is after this house in a real and tangible way. He brought me to do this journey so that I could stand on this stage and tell you that he is after you. So we're gonna take three minutes and I encourage you, close your eyes. Do not look around. This isn't, there's literally no one else in the room except for you and Jesus right now. And ask him, what is the one thing in my life that is exalting itself above you?
funny how three minutes seems like an eternity and not enough time on the same minute, right? The last thing that God called me to do was to be prayerful. He showed me what my weakness was. He showed me what I needed to tear down. And then he said, just come to me. God really likes you. Yes, he loves you, but he also really likes you. He likes talking to you. He likes knowing. He's a God of details. He's a God of intention. He's a God of purpose. He doesn't do things just to do things. He doesn't say things just to say things. It's because he cares about you, because he loves you. You individually, not us as a people, but you individually, you as a person. He cares what your favorite food is, what your favorite color is. He cares. He cares. He cares. He cares about the things that are making themselves more important than him. He cares. On the back of your notes, you'll see there's a place that says, what, what is exalting itself above God? Take this and take it to him. Take it to him. Bring your biggest issue, your number one thing that's pulling itself above the Lord and take it to him and he will show you the way to walk. Be vulnerable about this thing and suddenly you'll find accountability and friendship and love and acceptance in places that you never even thought possible. Every time a lie exalted itself above my head and above the Lord, I was met with resounding encouragement from the people in this house resounding over and over and over again. People spoke truth to me when I was believing a lie over and over again. Be honest about that lie. Be honest about it. Don't ignore it and sweep it under the rug and try to numb your life. Don't do that. Don't do that. It will not serve you. It will only hurt you. And be prayerful. Prayer is the most powerful tool that you have. It is the only thing that will change the spiritual atmosphere around you is when you talk to him and ask him. You want to know what it is? Ask him. You want to know how to walk this? Ask him. Want to know how to give it up? Ask him. Just ask him. Just talk to him. I'm sitting on this side, point B. I've gotten from point A to point B. There's point C and D and E and F and and so on for the rest of my life. God is all about the process. There's never really an end point where I, fun, where I can finally say, I know enough about God. That doesn't exist. It's all about the process. It's all about choosing to believe that he is who he says that he is and that you are who, you, who he says that you are. You know, I think that all of us have something that's exalting itself above the Lord. So originally I was going to do an altar call. Uh, instead, I'm just, going to, I'm just going to pray for us. I'm just going to pray for this house. And I encourage you to pray with me, to pray out loud with me. Let's all pray together. Let's all be a house. Let's all know that we're broken, that we're a hot mess, that we need each other, that we need church, that we need people, that we need honesty and vulnerability and all of these things. Let's close out tonight and let's just pray together. Yeah? Stand up with me. Let's do this. Dear Heavenly Father, we just thank you, God. We thank you for tonight, God. We thank you that you are after us, that you are hungry for us, that you will never stop relenting, God. We thank you that you will tenaciously chase us down and run after us, God, every minute of every day for the rest of our lives. God, we thank you that you care about our hearts, that you care about our lives, that you care about our minds. God, we thank you that your desire is that nothing would exalt itself above the name of God, that nothing would be greater than your glory, that nothing would rise up, God, that you would tear down anything that exalts itself above the name of God in our lives in the name of Jesus. God, I ask that you make it apparent. I ask that you make us aware of your presence. God, that as you are with us every second of every day, there is nothing hidden from your sight. There is nothing beyond your mercy. There is nothing beyond your grace. God, we thank you that there is nothing that will ever separate us from the love of God, not angels or demons or anything in between. God, there is literally nothing that can keep you from us and 
in us from you. God, we thank you that there's no mistake that we can make that makes you love us any less or care any less. God, we thank you that no matter what sin we have, no matter what we're struggling with, no matter what weakness we have, God, that you have put us in a place that is worthy of vulnerability, that you have put us in a house of people who love you and who are hungry for you and who desire to know you. God, I ask that you release a spirit of prayer in this house tonight, that you would release a spirit of prayer in this house tonight, that we would know how to talk to you, that we would know how to come to you, that we would know how to say, God, and even as we lose words, God, that we would groan from within and deep would cry out to deep, God, that we would truly understand what a spirit of prayer looks like. God, I ask that you raise up a spirit of obedience in this house, that we would be able to say yes to you and no to the world, that we would be able to say yes to what you're calling us to. Whatever it looks like, whatever it sounds like, whatever it feels like, God, we just want to love you more. We want to be a people that are known by our love for you, that are known by our obedience to you and our willingness to walk out whatever you call us to do, regardless of the consequences, regardless of what it costs us in our lives. We just want you. God, I ask that you build up inside of us the ability to know that you are the God that you declare to be, that you are love, that you are mercy, that you are kindness, that you are grace, that you are the judge. You're the only one who matters. You're the only thing that matters. And God, I ask that you make this that a reality in this house like never before. God, I ask that you allow us to need each other, to be vulnerable, to bring our greatest struggles, our greatest issues, and just lay it at the foot of the cross like never before. God, that we would trust you that we would trust your heart for us, that we would trust your plan for us. And God, that no matter how we feel, that we do not trust our feelings, that we trust your goodness, that we trust your words outside of anything. God, we choose obedience over comfort every day. Every day, God, I ask that you just show us how much you love us, that we would truly fall in love with this man, Christ Jesus, who hung on a cross and died for the things that I have done wrong. God, that we would see your face and know it. That we would know what your face looks like every day and that no matter what, God, that you would let your face shine upon us. God, let this house be a house that is marked for you. God, I just ask that you come, that we would be ever aware of your presence. Ever aware that we would wake up and your name would be on our lips. That we would go to sleep and that we would dream about your goodness, oh God that you release a prophetic spirit in this house, that we would be able to hear you. God, that you would release healing in this house, that we would be healed for your glory. God, we thank you that you are who you say you are, God. Amen.